What's happening, you guys? Today, I have Steve Stevens, guitar player, Billy Idol's guitar player, an amazing guitar player on the show today. I think you're going to love this interview. We talk about all kinds of stuff. We talk about how um, he started playing with Billy. We started talking about how he started playing guitar. We talk about touring. We talk about why he has his lip pierced, which is a great story. We talk about how he went from Steve Snyder to Steve Stevens. So we get into that. We talk about him playing with Michael Jackson, which evidently is one of the most often asked questions. Um, talk about the fact that they were the last band to play uh, Max's Kansas City in New York, which huge, huge facility, huge venue that a lot of great uh, bands played, and they were the last band to play there. So we get into that. We talk about touring in Japan, what that's like. We talk about the fact that he's on Cameo now, and you can get him to say a little something for you to people or to yourself uh, there on Cameo. You can also have a little interaction back and forth with him on Cameo also. We talk about uh, he was recording with Billy Idol some new stuff and how they're doing that with COVID and all that kind of thing. So check it out. Lots of really cool info. This is a long one, about an hour and 30 minutes or so, but it's totally worth it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know what you think. Cool. Well, dude, thank you. I really appreciate you being willing to do this and oh yeah so quick. absolutely yeah okay before i get into all the stuff i want to talk about what are the most often asked questions that you get because i guarantee i know there's got to be at least a handful that you were asked every single time so let's knock those out of the park and just get rid of them right now uh yeah what's michael jackson like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, i'm sure yeah, yeah. Is that a good thing uh, yeah, my experience was great. I mean, um, you know, uh, when I worked with him, Quincy Jones was still his producer, and uh, it was very much the same team that worked on those records from uh, Off the Wall up through the Bad album that I did. Oh, yeah. After that, after that, Quincy wasn't involved. But yeah, I mean, it was it was terrific, fantastic. Did you, you did the video for that as well with him, right? I sure did. Were you guys yeah. doing all at the same time? I can't remember. I remember seeing the video. I haven't looked at it mm. recently, but was I get the feeling it was like a stage performance. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was on a soundstage. Uh, you know, obviously you're miming, but but right. uh, it was a live performance video. Okay. So they didn't they didn't ask me to do any weird <laughs> monster makeup or anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which might right. have been might have been cool, but we I, I, I have yeah. to say that's my favorite Michael Jackson song. Oh and really? Yeah. All, I'm ninety nine percent sure it's all because of you. Oh thanks. You know, because so when I, it's first time I heard that guitar, I was like, Holy <laughs> shit, this is Yeah, beautiful. I mean I was you know, when they um I mean, uh, obviously, you know, Eddie Van Halen set the precedent on the previous record with Beat It, and it was, it became like, okay, Michael's got a rock track, you know. Right. And when they contacted us, actually, Quincy Jones contacted me. Um, I said, well, send me, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, because this is the days of cassettes and right. things, you know. So the label sent over, I was still living in New York, they were in Los Angeles, sent a cassette, and I was surprised at how kind of rock it really was, you know, even before the guitars got on there. So so um, it was, uh, you know, I felt right at home on it. Yeah, it was good, man. Because I remember the Eddie Van Halen the, for that, the solo was great. Yeah. I, but the Dirty Diana one, the whole thing, man, from the beginning to it's solo. It's kind of dark. Yeah, it was kind of yeah. like, um, it was definitely different for him. You know, I, like I said, I wasn't expecting, uh, you know, a track like that. Maybe that's why I liked it so much because it was yeah. different. I mean, yeah. I like Michael Jackson, but that track was just something where I was like, damn, that was oh, awesome. pretty damn cool. Yeah. So what about the guitar thing, man? I know you started, what, like you were eight or something, right? Pretty, uh, yeah. My dad got a, uh, a really cheap, I think it cost him 30 bucks with a, with a music book. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, back then... Um, it was a character named Burl Ives, who was a folk singer, right? Yeah. So it was the Burl Ives music guitar book, you know, package thing. He got it at the, uh, at the um, you know, department store, brought it home. He never, as far as I remember, he never touched it, you know? Really? Um, yeah, he was blue collar. You know, he was, a, he was an offset printer and 
Uh, I remember by then, uh, you know, he, he put in the hours. And by the time after he had dinner, my dad was exhausted. Oh, yeah, know? I bet. Could, I always remember him, you know, sitting to watch the news or something after dinner. Or so he'd just fall asleep. Was like, he one of these dudes who would come home and, like, sit down in the chair with his glass of bourbon or whatever, beer or whatever, and sit there and watch – the news and like you said fall asleep and well we did we always you know i mean we always ate dinner together yeah, um and um and then uh and then we watched some tv usually it was uh you know um you know series or batman or yeah. or uh, star trek or whatever it was that was happening at the time by the time we get halfway through dad was sleeping you know, <laughs> so, so lo and behold the guitar ended up in my room um, and I was just banging away on it. I had no idea, but, but, uh, my, my, I have an older brother, five years older. So his friends, uh, a couple of them played guitar and they came over the house and they said, you know, he's making a hell of a racket on it, but it's in two, it's, it's in time. Right. You know, he's got rhythm. <laughs> he's got that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I was on that thing all the time. So, um, there was a folk singer uh, who came from my neighborhood named Phil Oaks. And uh, for those who don't know, there's actually a really good documentary on uh, iTunes about him. Oh, really? And he was, um, he was like another, kind of like a Bob Dylan, a little bit more political, but definitely from that Greenwich Village folk, folk scene. Well, he was from my neighborhood and his sister was a guitar teacher. And they arranged for me to go get some lessons from her. And that was the, you know, at least she got me how to tune, you know, get the guitar in tune. And, um, and I never, never look back, you know, I don't remember my parents ever having to say practice or anything. You know, I just loved it. I just, you know, and there was so much all back then, all the music had guitars in it. You couldn't get away from it. It was either yeah. rock, rock music, or you were seeing the Beatles and the Stones on, on TV and Ed Sullivan and all this. So the guitar was like, uh, you know, it was, it was, Everybody played guitar. In my oh, yeah. Head. Everybody. So, um, so it was just a natural for me, I think. Did you learn music theory and all that as well from her? Or did you learn it at all? Not from her. Um, no. She kind of um, kind of got me on my way. Um, and then there was, oh, man, it was hard to find guitar teachers back then. Um, and they found me one guy who was like a, you know, he, he was a begrudging, <laughs> begrudgingly a teacher. And, um, and he didn't, you know, I'd be asking, you know, I want to learn how to play satisfaction or she loves you or so, yeah. you know, and this guy was not having it. He was like into sold fuddy duddy stuff. And uh, I kind of just decided at that point just to kind of le learn stuff on, on my own, on my, with my ear, you know, picking up the needle off the record player. Yeah. But then um, my parents sent me to a, for two years, a uh, music camp, uh, which is still in existence out in Long Island. And the guitar teacher was a flamenco guitarist. Oh, wow. And that was, that was my first exposure to flamenco. And um, this guy, um, his name was Nicholas Zininovich. And he was a Romanian gypsy who had escaped the Nazis in the Second World War with his guitar oh, wow. and he had so much passion about it and wanted to pass on whatever knowledge that he had about this instrument into us and you couldn't help but but a respect the guy and also flamenco was like something i just went wow what is this it's not it's not classical because i didn't want to learn classical that was that seemed kind of boring to me but this guy was fiery he was like you know banging on the guitar and making a you know a, a, a cacophony of you know it was like i want to do that you know so um that was the first guy that i really kind of like took my lead from yeah i was watching um a video of you doing flamenco and dude you're amazing i mean i think a lot of people probably don't cons think of that in you of course you know they think billy idol whatever rock guitarist but yeah damn that was really good i was impressed it was amazing thank you i'm not a traditional flamenco player you know those guys play with their fingers right, and yeah. uh, i primarily use a pick um but there was a, a record that came out i guess about when i was 13 or 14 which had the premier flamenco guitarist Paco de Lucia and he was joined by Al Dimiola and John McLaughlin two great jazz guitar players yeah. and, th and those guys 
uh, played with picks and I went, oh yeah, I can kind of, I can kind of, as long as I understand flamenco and understand the changes, I can apply the way that I play to it. So, um, and that's been my approach ever since. And your manager said you're coming out, you're working on a new album, solo album like that? I'm working on some new music where we're kind of just formulating. I think the, I think the general blueprint is to have guest artists on it, you know, guest singers, yeah. um, which leaves me wide open to stylistic, you know, because I don't, uh, you know, I'm one of those guitar players. I like all different styles of things. And um, being with Billy, that's kind of afforded me because we delve into a little bit of everything over the years. And, yeah. Uh, so I think, I, I, I think, you know my audience accepts that they don't they don't if if they get music from me they they know it's not just going to be one type of thing so um uh, i'm looking forward to that yeah which i think that's very cool to have you're not just pigeonholed into that one thing you can kind of play different stuff and move on i think that's play. yeah i think that's what being a musician should should be about you know the 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 guy you know you always read about um you know, obviously Led Zeppelin was a big influence on me and Jimmy Page would go off to India to learn some Indian stuff and yeah. his little influences of that. And obviously blues and um, I mean, music is music, you know, it's, it's not, it, it, you know, you shouldn't have to just be one thing. If you're just sitting around playing for fun at home, what do you play? Do you play flamingo stuff or do you play more of the rock or do you blues or what? Um, uh, it's always on an acoustic guitar, you know, yeah. every, every, th and it's, I guess that's, I started on acoustic. Uh, like I said, you know, it's about seven and a half and I didn't get an electric till I was 13. So th there was a good, you know, like basic grounding of acoustic and, yeah. and that stays, stays with you. And whenever I write a song with somebody, it's always on acoustic guitar, you know, it's always, uh, is you know, uh, as an example with Billy Idol, you know, we'll sit down with two acoustic guitars. And if you can make a song work like that, you know, you have something, whereas you don't really want to rely on the effects or you know, right. the, or studio gimmickry or anything. If it works on acoustic, you've got something. So I always start on acoustic. And um, uh, last night, uh, as an example, okay, so my wife is sleeping and I'm up, uh, you know, I'm keep later hours than her i'm always tinkering in studio so i uh pick up the acoustic i started playing um there's a, a thing that greg lake did uh I, I believe in father christmas or something and i thought oh yeah i could make a instagram video playing this so i started working on that and putting my own thing on it so it's always i'm always playing something different you know keep keep my my yeah. my, myself challenged a little bit and um and uh and try and come up with chord shapes and changes and things and I, you know very simply I, I have my iphone and just record those ideas i'm always looking for new ideas rather than uh sitting down to practice scales and all that right. so that stuff bores me i mean i i, I don't really I, I think i think i'm proficient on the yeah. instrument. <laughs> it's not it's not like i can play everything right but, but but I'd rather come up with a good song idea than than master some new scale or something. You know? well, it makes sense. It's not as boring. Scales are just boring. Yeah, I mean, and and then it becomes, you know, when when you know, I don't know, you know, I, I think I play slower and simpler now than I did, you know, maybe in the '80s or something, where you yeah. feel you have something to prove. And wow, look at me! Look how fast I can play. You know, I've learned that right. it really doesn't matter that much. <laughs> You know, play something that people can remember, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's it's how fast you can play doesn't translate into necessarily, I think, how good a guitarist you are. I think it just means you can play fast. Like, Yngwie could play fast as hell, but I never really thought his music was that great as far as the songs and all that go compared to what you do. The lyric, musically, it's more attractive to me what you do than what Ingve was doing, even though he's a great guitarist and can shred it. Sure. Yeah. I think that, yeah, his, his, his goals are entirely different yeah. than, than mine. I learned a valuable, not a lesson, but a, a kind of eye opening thing when we went down to South America uh, to tour because the audience is down there. Uh, not only do they sing the lyrics back to you, but they sing the guitar solos. Really? So if, yeah. So if you've got one that, that can be sung, 
it's an incredible, I've, you know, the first time it happened, I was like, this is unbelievable. You know, it's like you've got, you know, 50,000 people singing your solo with you. It's so powerful. So from then on, I realized I have to have solos that people can sing, you know. That's uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah. I never knew that was a thing. Yeah, it's, it's, especially in South America. They'll, they sing, t you know, obviously they sing their football chants and all this kind of stuff, right. but they don't stop when the solo comes. They sing it. That's a trip, man. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Speaking of touring, do you remember your first tour? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Um, you know, I was, I, I, from the time I was 18, uh, I had joined a cover band and we were uh, playing the Long Island club scene and which was a really happy and fertile thing yeah. and we were we were playing already you know three four nights a week we had we had our own pa we had our own truck and, oh wow um so to me that it's almost like touring although yeah. you're not you know it was the, the new york tri-state area but but i remember the first billy idol tour it was really rough it was you know, people don't realize that even though the first record we did had White Wedding on it, uh, the record wasn't a huge, massive success or anything. We were playing small little clubs and um, in the dead of winter, I remember being up in Canada and freezing and we're on a van, you know, this was before a tour bus or anything like that. Was all and, you guys in one van? Mm -hmm, yeah, with the crew and uh, yeah. How big was the was, van? <laughs> Uh, we didn't, we only had like two roadies. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, at that time, uh, the, the band had, you know, five members in it. It's, you know, like a sprinter van or whatever. Okay. But, but uh, it was like, it, it, you know, a, le a, le a lesser dedicated person would have thought twice about this. <laughs> this is a career move because it was rough, man. It was, you know, when we were out there slugging away and just, trying to get noticed, you know, and uh, it, uh, it definitely uh, was a little bit eye opening for me. What point did you know this is what you want to do? Like play guitar for a living? Um, I think the first time I played in front of an really? audience. Yeah, I think, you know. How old were you? Uh, I was 13. In front of an audience? Yeah, really? I played at the local Y. Okay. <laughs> and um, and I had to borrow some gear, you know, I had, I didn't have, I didn't really have a proper guitar amp. I had a little tiny guitar amp. And, um, but, um, you know, I saw the reaction on people's face when you'd start a riff or like I mentioned, you know, uh, you know. What was the first song you like, played? You remember? Uh, well, I'm, I don't remember on that. I remember for, for, um, for class show and tell, one year I played Fire and Rain by, by uh, uh, James Taylor. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a song by America called Horse With No Name, which was, yeah. you know, these are all acoustic songs. So, uh, so those were my show and tell pieces. Oh, wow, man. Yeah, yeah. But I loved it. Yeah, I loved it right from, I loved performing. I love, you know, um, it was a way to express myself, you know. I wasn't, um, you know, a smaller kid. I wasn't going to play football because I would, get squashed yeah. uh i was reasonably okay on the basketball court but you know not as good as some of the you know most of the kids actually so so <laughs> guitar was my way to kind of you know express myself damn yeah 13 that's that's amazing to be playing out in front of those kids at thir everybody at 13 do you remember what your first what was your first electric who was it made by uh, Univox. It was. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember and, those. Uh, and they were based out in uh, Long Island, so you could get pretty good deals on them. And it was clear. I wanted to, you know, it was a copy of a of a guitar. I now own the real version. Okay. Uh, but it served me well, you know. It's, it, uh, you know, and it, I remember I got my first fuzz box, and you know, it was huh. like I was on my way because at that point, you know, you could imagine there were some rock things I could play on acoustic. You know, T Tommy by the Who was. You could play Pinball Wizard and things like that, but you couldn't really play Hendrix. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it was hard to kind of emulate the more heavy things that would come. So when I got the electric guitar and the fuzz box, I was off and running. Oh, know? I bet. Yeah. Yeah, damn. So when you were doing this tour with Billy, you guys have been together for what, like 30 something years? Um, kind of a thing? Yeah, 30, 38 years we've yeah. worked together. Yeah. So what do y'all do when you fight? 
<laughs> I know you got to fight. So, I mean, how do you, well, we don't a married couple. Do you sit there and go, okay, you don't talk to each other for about an hour or two and you come back together and go, okay, we, let's make up. We, we don't know. We, we don't. And there was a brief period. We never really fought. I, I have to say. Really? Yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons is, you know, it was, you know, I had, I had bummed around with, with, with different bands and tried to, uh, you know, uh, get record deals with my previous band and all this. But when I met Billy, he already had his deal. Uh, he had moved to, uh, to New York from England and I respected him. And I think, um, I think it's, you know, ult the ultimate decision musically is, is really down to him. It's his name on the album. Right. Uh, but he knows that I won't kiss his ass and he knows that I'll give him a, an honest opinion and sometimes challenge an idea. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it, it's never been, we'd never, never really had an adversarial kind of thing. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, there was a brief uh, period of time uh, in the late eighties, he was going to move to New York. We had finished the third record I did with him with last smile and he was moving to Los Angeles. I wanted to stay in New York. Um, and I had had, by then we had success and I had record labels, you know, courting me and I signed with Warner Brothers to do uh, a solo, uh, to, to do a solo deal. Um, so I said, look, I'm going to stay in New York. I don't want to move to Los Angeles. I'm going to do this record for Warner Brothers. But it was not a falling out. It was, we wished each other luck. And then when he uh, went and did the, the record without me, we never slagged each other off, you know, it was, I always wished him well. And uh, I remember even after I'd left the band, I came to his, his baby shower. And when he had his motorcycle accident, I wow. got, got on the phone and said, Hey, you need me to come out there or what, you know? Um, so when we got back together, there, there was, we didn't have to make amends because right. it was like, Hey, it's great to see you again, you know? And, and I think, I think now we just have great respect for each other. And I, I think he's probably my biggest fan. I mean, I'm his, you know, I get on stage with the guy and I've, I've worked with the best of the best, you know, yeah. been really fortunate to work with some incredible singers, but there's something about the chemistry that we have together and the energy that's created and the, and the, understand this kind of like telepathic if he does something i think he knows what i'll do and i'll same uh and i think that's just you know that, that that's i always tell people you know uh, you know when we're putting together a tour or something they'll you know put the lights together and you know do all the oh do you want pyro no we don't want pyro and i always say the best special effect we have is the is the chemistry between he and i and um, and I think the audience recognizes that it's not fake. It's not funny. Right. Um, and we, we value that. So I think we're careful to like, you know, give each other some space and, and, and let each other express each other musically. Like the guy gives me the opportunity to do a, uh, you know, 15 minute, uh, flamenco solo, oh, wow. you know, there's not many singers that are going to be like, oh, well, save it for your own right, tour, yeah. you know, and he's just, you know, he's cool with that. You know, he's cool with, you know, if I've, if I've played a good solo after, you know, there's one song, Blue Highway, we do where he's extended solo yeah. and afterwards he always, he, he'll, you give me the thumbs up, you know, like, that was really good, you know. It's like I'm playing. I'm playing to impress that guy first off. Right. You know, make sure he's digging it. If he digs it, chances are the audience is going to dig it. That's pretty cool. Do yeah. You, so, are you? I'm assuming. Are this at this point? Are you considered like partners with Billy, or are you still like a hired gun kind of thing? No, no, we're partners, and obviously co co writing the music right. with him. Uh, you know, Did it start off as a hired gun, then you became partners, or was it always a partner's deal? You know what? From the very get go, the first after meeting a couple of days, we sat down to write songs together, oh, wow. and, That's and it's always been fifty fifty. Um, I think uh, you know. I think Billy coming from the from the punk rock thing is there's he, he the band stays at the same hotels we travel the same that guy treats the band so well because I hear uh, horror stories from other bands that that uh, you know work with a, a a singer 
uh, as opposed to being in a, in a bad situation. And, and even, I will tell you that the 75% of the time, if you see a band name or something, there's usually one or two guys who are running the show. Right. It's, you know, because you need that. You need leadership and you need focus. And, and if, if it's too many people and too many ideas, it, it gets a little messy sometimes. Um, but I will say that Billy loves being in a band and he's very loyal to his band members and uh, really, 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 we, we have a great group of guys that some have been with us, you know, 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it feels more like a band than I think most bands do. Right. You know, well, that's good. Yeah. What's the biggest difference between say recording with Billy or writing with Billy and doing your solo thing? Um, well, obviously, you know, this, when I do a solo thing, it's usually to, you know, I usually look at it as a, I have the opportunity to do stuff that I wouldn't do with other, not just Billy, but with other artists, like doing a flamenco uh, yeah. based record. And that was, that came about because I had, I, uh, I had done a record with Vince Neil, the singer Motley Crue. Yeah. And then we went out on tour and we, t uh, we were on tour supporting Van Halen uh, for about six weeks. And that was kind of like, you know, that was a night of guitar gymnastics like oh, you wouldn't yeah. believe. You know, we were both like, all right, you know. And um, so I, you know, and it was also kind of the end of, end of the 80s, 90s, all the kind of excesses and everything that went along with it. That was the last hurrah for, for us. You know, we had to grow up and become adults after right, that. Right, after that one. <laughs> yeah. So I needed to decompress at that, at that point. I, you know, I couldn't play any louder. couldn't play any faster. It was all on 11 and I came off the road and I decided to get sober and kind of clean up my, my lifestyle. And, uh, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, now, what, what, you know, and, um, and I went to see Paco de Lucia, the flamenco guitar player. Oh. And he was, was playing here at the Wilton Theater. It's like 3,000 people. And there was 3,000 people going absolutely crazy for this guy on stage just with his guitar. And I thought, man, that's, that's, really, that's really success. And it was a lot of, it was really mixed. Women, men, children, everything. It was, it was you know, people of Spanish heritage, people of whatever. Everybody was just there to like kind of, rejoice in in this amazing music and i put down my electric i decided to put down my electric guitar for a year and do a flamenco based record and uh i traveled i went to france i went to england i went to japan uh just with my guitar uh to write songs with people and compile this record and um and that's you know that that's something i can only do as a solo artist so i look towards those kind of um you know, opportunities. The next record I did, uh, Memory Crash, is an instrumental record, but it was largely influenced. I wanted to pay homage to the guitar players that really influenced me. So there's like an underlying script in it. Uh, if you listen, you can hear hear clearly the Robin Trower influence or the Steve Howe from Yes influence or the Jimmy Page. Um, so I think for my for my next record uh, is is you know, I want to, I think the ultimate goal is really to make people feel the way I did when I was a 13 year old kid getting, getting the new Led Zeppelin record or new Stones record and, or going to a concert, you know, and, and bringing that excitement about it. You know, I still try and tap into that. If I can do that, you know, the, and, and even if it's one person, then to me, that's the success, you know, um, I don't ever look at it as, you know, I mean, uh, I think now, you know, with record sales being what, what they are and online, you don't, we, as musicians, we don't really, we can't support ourselves doing, doing it, do, doing it that way. So you might as well do what you love because if you, you know, if you're going to put it out there, I, I think if you love it, then other people will love it. If right. you're doing it for the sake of, fulfilling uh some a and r guy's idea of what you should be doing and so it's that's a losing game as far as i'm concerned for, for me yeah, yeah, so, about the, yeah. The, everything changed how has touring changed for you since 
the whole record industry's changed and all that. And since you first, I guess, and since you first started in the back of the van going to Canada yeah. and freezing your yeah. ass off, how did it change between, say, that first tour, the height of popularity, and then when the record industry just changed completely? Well, I think touring became more important, you know, and, and now majority of artists uh, see revenue from touring. So it's, it's, uh, it's gotten much, went yeah. Up. yeah, I mean, yeah, ticket prices went up. Um, but also, you know, obviously before COVID hit, um, you know, bands would spend, I think, you know, a large percentage of the year or at least you know, seven months uh, out on the road touring. You become more aware of what you're spending. Uh, you know, back then we weren't even aware of merch sales or things right. like that. We were pretty oblivious. I will say that even when we went out and <clears throat> and toured behind Rebel Yell, you know, we finally we got a tour bus, but we were still playing small places. And then little by little, as the tour progressed, we were playing bigger places. And then we got to Los Angeles and we played uh, Santa Monica Civic. And we were like, we must be doing pretty good. We're playing Santa, you know, and then yeah. you start, then you start getting the phone calls from the label guy. Hey, you know, you're number 10 or, you you know, <clears throat> then you got two buses and then you got, you know, you, you're in a, an arena and you got a real PA system and lights and all, you know, but <clears throat> it really happened while we were doing it. So uh, we were pretty, pretty unaware of it. It was, gr it was great to see it happen, yeah. you know, but um, but now obviously it's it's a business and you you know you're you're aware every, every aspect of it or even down to having to downsize your gear so it can fit in a in a truck or a, a cargo boat uh, because you know gas you're aware of how much ga gas costs to get your gear from point A to point B and usually what bands will do now is they'll have a set of equipment in the states and a set of equipment in in Europe so you're cutting down on uh, expenditures and, and uh, uh, you know, but it is, I mean, the food is better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're fortunate we stay in really nice hotels, you know, uh, and, uh, and also my wife travels with me. So oh, that's good. Uh, we made that clear when we, when we actually really early on in our relationship, um, you know, I had, I had, I had, you know, been around the world a number and number of times and never, never really got to see anything. And I, yeah. and I knew if, if she came along, she'd be, okay, we're going to go to a museum. We're going to go here. You know, she gets me out of the hotel. Which is great because I understand because when I shoot okay. a lot of times I'll go to some place and, you know, everybody like, Oh my God, you just went to wherever, you know, what'd you see? I'm like, I saw nothing. I saw yeah. the location. I saw the hotel. Yeah. And yeah. there'd be times, even like one of the first few times I would go to New York, if I yeah. didn't have a shoot or a meeting, I'd basically just stay in the room. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's easy to fall into that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, with, with her, and she'll arrange for stuff for the whole band. I mean, she's- Oh, that's cool. She, uh, you know, she helps run the uh, meet and greets and stuff. You know, she's just, I uh, mean, it's, it's uh, unfortunate. I mean, it's not for every spouse and it can get into like the Yoko Ono thing, but right. with, with her, she can, I mean, she'll go off and do stuff with the crew and stuff if I don't want to do, you know, it's like, hey, go, we, we're very independent. Um, and we, uh, we really enjoy the, the, the what we bring to the band, which is a sense of, you know, it really is. You become a family after yeah. a while, you know, you're out there and you're, they're like brothers and sisters, you know. It sounds like you got a good one. She's amazing. Yeah. She's really amazing. I'm very, it's, it's my greatest achievement is, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully she feels the same way. But <laughs> yeah, that's good to hear, man. Yeah. When you guys were touring, you tour, does everybody ride on the same bus? Do you have, or did you all ride on the same bus? I would assume maybe, do you and your wife have a bus for you now? Or is it, how's that play out? It's always different. Um, yeah. uh, I'm not great at flying. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'd much rather be on a bus. I, I love being on a, a tour bus. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's like the Griswolds. Or so, you oh, know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but a lot of times, like we do the Vegas uh, residency a lot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with that, we have a private uh, jet because we're only <clears throat> living in Los Angeles you can finish your show on a Saturday and be home in bed by about one in the morning if you fly back you know fly back private um, but um, a lot of times if Billy will want to fly 
or something, I'll take the bus. Uh, and in Europe, we did that. And we were so, we were really, my wife was overjoyed. We got Dolly Parton's bus, really? so, which had a chandelier in it and a, bath, <laughs> a bathtub. And, and uh, so oh, my, wow. my wife loves Dolly Parton. So we, she was, you know. <laughs> Did she watch the Dolly Parton Christmas special or whatever? Oh, no, but it's on the books. We're going to yeah. watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that was on the yeah. other night. So, but, um, so yeah, you know, um, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I've always loved the bust thing. You know, um, I think you know, I, I, uh, I was on, I was forty years old by the time I got my driver's license. Really? Because I was, I was living in Manhattan. I was so a number one. You, to, the price of keeping a car in, the, in a garage in the city is as much as a, a you know, an apartment. Yeah. <clears throat> and then. Um, so, you know, from the time I was about 22, I'm on a tour bus. So that's my, that's my wheels, you know, that I grew up on a tour bus kind of, you know, so um, I just like, I, I love that whole experience. When did you move to LA? Uh, about 26 years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You have cars now? Yeah. <laughs> we do. Actually, you collecting we, cars we, at this point? No, we don't, you know, we, we leased a car. <clears throat> and then um, my lease last year, I was touring a lot. My lease expired. So I said, well, wait till uh, I'm not going to get a new car and have it sit in my garage for no reason. And, yeah. uh, and, um, and we weren't, I won't na name the manufacturer. I won't. <laughs> we were not happy with the car we had. Couldn't wait to get out of the lease. Um, and um, <laughs> so we said, all right, we, the, we finished in March in Vegas. So we said, oh, we'll get a new car. Uh, you know, uh, once we get back home and COVID hit and like nobody's driving anywhere. Oh. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we're, we're, we're right now, we're just locked. I mean, they just locked us down here in LA. And, yeah. I heard you got locked down again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah damn. So, uh, yeah. So you just have one car for the two of we you? We did. Yeah. My, <coughs> Y'all really do stay together. Yeah, we used to have two cars. Um, my wife uh, stopped driving a little bit a little while ago. She had, you know, she was a model, and she had. I mean, when we first met, she'd be driving to these auditions and shoots way out. You know, two hours. I mean, she tra traversed the entire state of California, uh, and she grew up with cars. She's from Chicago, and you know, she, she uh, she'd rather be driven. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. I don't blame her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame her either. Do you have a tour that sticks in your head as like your favorite tour that you guys have done? Um, wow. I, you know, I'd say that, um, I mean, they're still great. I mean, we finished at the end of the year. We were in uh, New Zealand and Australia. And it oh, wow. was, I mean, it's just beautiful country and, and, um, and, you know, it's still the amazing thing is, you know, uh, you know, almost 40 years later being with Billy, it's our shows are, you know, it's still cool to like Billy Idol. You yeah. know? And um, somehow, even though we made our career in the 80s, I think it's, you know, the the I mean, now, obviously, at a show, you know, you have people that bring their kids and uh, and then there's a there's a lot of young people that kind of grew up with maybe things like green day or mm -hmm. some of the second or, or for me, third generation punk rock stuff, which really pays homage to a lot of this stuff, like Billy's band previous to me, even generation X. So we have, you know, really diverse audience and, um, and we still pack them in, you know? So that was an incredible tour for me. And obviously, you know, the rebel yell tour to see it all blow up. That's a, you know, I'll never relive that because it it only happens once in your career to for something like that. So, uh, um, you know, that, you know, it's great to like, yeah, the two tours that stand out for me are, you know, 35 years apart. Wow. Yeah, actually, I told my daughter I was going to be talking to you today. I was like, do you know who Billy Idol is? She goes, yeah. Yeah, she's 20 years old. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so like, a lot of you guys. Yeah, he's just done a, a duet with Miley Cyrus as well. So oh, really, it's yeah, it's pretty, it's great. It's uh, you know she and she's got and, a cool uh, voice. Yeah, and it's and it's and he's a he's a better singer now than he ever was. I mean, it's it's 
you know, that dude just, I mean, it's still, you know, when even, you know, to sit down and write a song or something and I hear, I just, it's, when I play guitar and it's in the rock idiom or, or, or about, be it ballad or rocker, I just hear that, I hear his voice in it, you know? Yeah. I can't not, it's, I've been doing it for so long that I know where the chords should lie. I know what melodies are comfortable or where we're gonna go with it. And, um, and it's just, uh, you know, um, it's still cool, you know? It's still, it's still enjoyable, it's still cool. And, uh, and uh, man, uh, you know, my other musician friends, I don't think they feel that way about, right. you know, some, some do, some, yeah. you know, some will have, you know, uh, you know, like, um, you know, like guys in Jane's Addiction, like Dave Navarro, obviously him and Perry have that, that thing where it's the, it's the sound of their combined things. And, um, and I think when you find that, you go, man, you know, it's really special, you know. It's good to know you guys never had to go to therapy like Metallica did. To keep your band together. He's English. He won't go. To, he's not. He's not <laughs> about not that. To, you're not uh, going to therapy anyway, uh, right? And uh, uh, I think they'd rather like get in the ring or so, settle it. Yeah. Settle it the, Eng <laughs> the English way. <laughs> Bare knuckle. <laughs> so is there? So when you took the time off from playing with Billy, and even when you have, I guess you're doing these solo things or you're playing with other people. Was there anybody you've been on stage with that you were just like? I'm blown away by the fact that you're on stage playing with this person, whether it's a guitarist or a singer or anybody like that. Um, well, obviously Michael Jackson, you know, yeah. was, you know, and to, <clears throat> and a lot of the stuff that we, you know, the, the, some of the stuff that happened during that performance wasn't captured. There was one bit <clears throat> and I'm like standing to the side, he's running and comes running and he slid through my legs. Really? He's skinny enough to do it. He goes through my legs, comes back from the other way and kind of grabbed my guitar and we're like, it's incredible. And everyone in the, on the soundstage breaks into, oh, that's, that's incredible. And they didn't get it. Why'd they cut show. that? Yeah, uh, they didn't get it on film well, They somehow. didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, he was very, it wasn't choreographed or anything like yeah. that. We didn't, he knew I wasn't going to be, you know, choreographed right, yeah. you know it was just like we could it was just like all right let's get up there and do what we do and you know that was incredible because that guy and then i got to perform with him live at madison square garden and uh you know that dude yeah, man, wow. you, you, know, you got you got shivers watching him dance and every body movement was you could tell that he studied and analyzed every films of himself of every movement because it was all perfect you know, it was, um, you know, th those guys from from that kind of school of R and B and stuff, where they choreograph and they, it's it's different. You know, us rock guys, we get up there and kind of like mumble about it, and get, you know. But with them, it's it's really part of the performance is choreography and all that, and and body of movement and uh, the attention to detail that that guy had about. Every movement was incredible. So, um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, there's been moments where uh, uh, we played, uh, played the opening of the, the Hard Rock Hotel in Vegas, and it was kind of an all-star thing. And at one point I was on stage with B.B. King and Bo Diddley. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tri and, uh, and, and, you know, I was there just to, you know, we, we had done the rock stuff and I performed with most rock performers. And then during theirs, I was kind of like, stepping back to let the you know yeah. the grand masters do their thing and at one point you know i'm just like back to playing you know and bb king points at me take a solo young man and i was like okay wow <laughs> I was, yeah i mean a he certainly didn't have to do that but yeah b <clears throat> to be accepted you know and then i i remember i played with carlos santana once and that was I mean, he's a trippy guy. He's very, he works on a very spiritual plane uh, and, uh, and speaks a language that's, um, you know, it's not just about notes and stuff. And, and it was, it was uh, you, when I was on stage trading solos with him, it was, you know, you know, it was pretty cool. The other time I will tell you is that, you know, I've worked with a lot of yeah. amazing people, but 
there's a band called Juno Reactor that I work with. It's one one guy, sort of techno outfit, and um, and uh, we we had done this track uh, called Pistolero, which eventually was licensed by Robert Rodriguez for Once Upon a Time in uh, in Mexico. And I went over to Japan to do a show with them, and there's three African percussionists from Africa, and they were they're called the Amampandos, Am called them the Pandos, and they were officially they were friends with Nelson Mandela and officially sanctioned as his musicians. And I mean, they're the real deal. I mean, they dress in the traditional African oh, yeah. garb, and and they just so we're in rehearsal. Uh, and um, my wife was there too. She experienced this. We're in rehearsal, and it's it's techno music, right? But it's like you know, rave, almost rave thing. And I'm doing my guitar thing, and it's heavy, and it's happening. And we had been rehearsing a couple of hours, and then the the pondos came in, and they walked in in a, in a single line with their drums, and they joined us. And it, I, it, I was, and I think everyone in the room, it was almost. I got high. Really? It, like literally viscerally was like overwhelming i had tears in my eyes when they wow. came in to do this and they kind of encircled us with this percussion and, Af and it was so i don't i don't want to say rudimentary but it, it but it worked on a level that that i had never experienced before and i got it i we finished and, I, and they, they introduced themselves and I walked out. So I got to use the bathroom sink and I looked at my wife, I go, did you feel that? She goes, that was incredible. I don't, she goes, I don't know what that is, but it's heavy. It's heavy stuff they're working oh, wow, with. Man. Yeah. And then we did the, uh, the uh, performance with them and that was the most, most, uh, that was the first time that I was physically affected by music other than just, loud <laughs> yeah. right yeah <laughs> how is your hearing by the way uh, i think it's okay my wife thinks i should get some some, some checkup <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it, i know it's better than some of the drummers i've worked with because those guys really have the hearing loss because of the symbols yeah imagine sitting behind the kit since you're a whatever teenager and those symbols are ear it's not the the drums right it's that the high symbols. frequency of the symbols That'll do you in. So all the drummers I know are deaf. You know, <laughs> do you wear deaf. earplugs now when you play? Live? We 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 have in ear monitors. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you don't need earplugs. You have the monitors. Yeah. Yeah. We got the monitors. Yeah. That's good. So, do you remember the first video you ever did? You ever shot? Um. Well, the, the first one was with a band before I was with Billy Idol. We shot some video. I, I wish I could find it. It'd be hysterical. Yeah. Um, but the first Billy Idol video was, uh, was Rebel Yell, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I remember thinking, uh, because Billy's videos before that were largely conceptual. Right. Uh, he had done Dancing With Myself with Toby Hooper, the director that did uh, Check. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh yeah. And then he did Dancing With Myself. And those were largely conceptual things, you know, and I thought, I thought, I really hope it's just a live performance thing. Cause I don't know, other than put the guitar on and dance around, I don't know what to do right. with the video, you know? <laughs> and it was the guy that directed it was Jeff Stein who did The Kids Are All Right, the uh, Who yeah. documentary. And he's a rock and roll guy. and. He just, we actually played on the video. We were set up and although the, the, the music that you hear is the recorded version, we're actually playing and we played for the audience after the video show. Oh, that's cool. It was at the uh, Tower Theater in, in, uh, in New Jersey, uh, Passaic, New Jersey, maybe. Um, so it was, it, it was, it was no different. All, the only difference was there was cameras, what, uh, you know, documenting it. But as far as what, we, what I was required to do was just yeah. play guitar, which was you funny. You have to do it multiple, multiple times? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, that's okay, you know. It's a, as long as I, you know, you know, put a guitar in my hands, I don't care. You know? Was there one video you ever did that you were just like, God, I just want this to end. Let me go home. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one that really makes me laugh now is the Catch My Fall video. By then, you know, by then we had done, uh, 
you know, Rebel Yell, Eyes right. on the Face, uh, Flesh of Fantasy. And they were all largely performance, even though they're in settings. But then we go to England and we're going to do Catch My Fall. And it was kind of this Apocalypse Now thing. And they sort of painted my face green, like camouflage. I'm in a forest and a tree catches on fire. And, and I thought, man, <laughs> it's just some silly shit. <laughs> I'll do it, you know. Right. And but it was the eighties. It was, you know, and I, you know, and, and then, you know, and I, I saw Billy who was painted up, and he's shirtless, and he's got like a shower scene that's taking the oh, yeah. paint off, right? And I go, well, he looks cool. And I kind of catch myself in the mirror. I look like a damn lizard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, I'm an iguana with a guitar at this point. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's very funny, but I remember thinking. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just yeah. Go with the flow, I guess. Just yeah, yeah. 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 Did you do your own hair? Because you had some um, I had crazy, some, amazing hair, man. I, you you know, know, you still uh, do. Uh, yeah, I'm fortunate. I still have it. You know, I mean, I don't know why, because, you know, uh, for whatever reason, <laughs> I still have my hair. It's, it's mine. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> I look at pictures, some of the pictures from the 80s now. I go, God damn. <laughs> you know, How long did it take you to do that hair? Well, we, we had, uh, back then we had, uh, you know, a hair guy. Oh, yeah, who okay. do, do the, you know, and I remember even I had a you hair. Tour? Yeah, we had hair, oh, makeup, cool. on tour, and all that stuff. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it was, a, you know, it was a part of it, I guess, you know. <laughs> hey, it, was, it, it worked, you know. For, for then, it was definitely working. I mean, everybody was doing it, I oh, think, yeah. you know. But, well, I remember uh, the first time I saw a Poison yeah. album, I thought, I was like, who are these four chicks? That was not yeah, bad looking. Yeah, these other three yeah. kind of, eh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you have to remember, you know, I'm, I'm from New York. And, and so I, I had, I, from the time I was, um, you know, I went to high school in Manhattan. So <clears throat> I kind of grew up with, you know, stuff like the New York Dolls and Kiss. Yeah. And it was, it was all about that. It was that, that second wave of English glam. Mm -hmm. you know, eventually glam became this LA kind of par almost parody of itself. Yeah. Um, although the, some of the music was quite good. There was, you know, people like Janie Lane had a great, you know, the guy in the Warren had a great voice. Oh, yeah. um, but in New York, it was, it was, it was, you know, kind of, we were all kind of devotees of the early New York, you know, glam thing or whatever, you know, the dolls and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I grew up in an era when, 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 um, <clears throat> when you, you, a musician or somebody was expected to be not normal. <laughs> yeah. You know, like the David Bowie's, you waited for his next incarnation. I remember the first Bowie record that I got was Aladdin Sane, and he saw, you know, it's the, 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 the lightning bolt. Yeah. And, and, um, and each band had a different image, and Peter Gabriel out of Genesis was doing all these costumes and things. It was, and Alice Cooper, it was all part of it. It was all like that was what being in a band more theatrical. Was a, very theatrical and um, and uh, and uh, even Zeppelin, you know, although they didn't wear the makeup and stuff, the clothes and the mm -hmm. attitude and the mysticism that was, oh, yeah. you know, there was this thing that they cultivated, which was, you know, very ooh, spooky, uh -huh. you know, and Sabbath certainly, and um, and I think that's you know when 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 that's your blueprint. It's such an impressionable thing on you that <clears throat> when it came time for, for me, you know, I, I, I wanted to be someone on stage that was worth paying money to see, you know, uh, you know, it w wasn't about, you know, being like the guy in the flannel shirt, you know, <laughs> it was about being a bit larger than life try or trying to be. I think it was great. I mean, I thought it was all the hair, the outfits to me. I mean, I always thought you were like the coolest because I just... Well, thanks. I mean, I still it's right. Like, the first time I saw you, like, holy shit, who's this dude? I mean, it's only a danger when that outweighs the, the substance of the music. Well, that was the know? thing you could play. Right. So it wasn't and, like you're this thing on stage. Right. But you play and it's eh. Yeah, I mean, you that's right. You play. So you it, have to, it you have to, distraction. you better back it up because yeah. uh, otherwise you're just a, a parody, you know, you, and people can sense that, you know, 
And I think that's what, ha what happened with the, that's why grunge happened for certain, you know, because the bands, it just became ridiculous and it was more about that. And when it was, it was, there's a lot of derogatory attitudes and oh, lyrics and stuff. And I think people just had it. They, they, I had seen that kind of thing happen a number of times, especially, you know, in New York, when, uh, Certainly, when CBGB started to happen, it was like time to like get rid of all this stuff and get back to the music again. And that that cycle will keep continue to happen all the time because um, you never want the, the imagery to outweigh the substance. Right. I think you're right. It gets to a point where the imagery does, and then it's just like this freak show on stage, but the music is in. And, and then the same thing with all these kind of rich rock stars in England who became, you know, you had had. Uh, economic uh, hardship a real tough time during thatcher and you know people don't even have a, 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 jo a job excuse me and they're squatting and and then you've got these guys flaunting their rolls royces and mansions you know the oh, yeah. the, the behemoth rock bands and i i was like fuck that why am i going to support them when i can't even put food on my table and that's yeah. that's punk rock that's it's like we're going to do it ourselves right and that's all good man that's you know when you, when the bands and the music lose sight of the audience and what what the real story is it's time to clean house you know that's probably why a lot of them don't last yeah they're, they're yeah. disappearing did you guys ever play cbgb's um no but we were the last group to ever play max's kansas city really <clears throat> i'm surprised it's not like common knowledge because max's was a, a legendary yeah. place and it had two d distinct phases because the first was obviously the the kind of andy warhol velvet underground scene and then that led into <clears throat> like aerosmith getting signed out of there and cheap trick and uh, Max's was the club that I always hung out in when I, when I lived in Manhattan. Um, and we got a call. <clears throat> Billy had a, had a friend who was playing and Max's was going to close and his friend was, was playing the last night. And Billy, you know, we, we just put the band together. We just had uh, enough, like maybe two or three songs. Yeah. And they called, he said, we're going to go play Max's tonight. And I go, what? what? And I goes, yeah. And um, he says, let's, let's meet at the at rehearsal at uh, whatever it was, one o'clock in the afternoon, because we're going to make T-shirts. Because <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't looked like we were in a band. Right, yeah. you know, we hadn't bought any clothes or anything. So Billy went out and bought, I think, like four Hanes white T-shirts. We had the fluorescent paint, just spraying them. So that we'd look, you know, somewhat <laughs> like we would belong together. Um, and then we got up and we played. We played a couple of Gen X songs and uh, a couple of our originals. And, and, uh, and I, I, you know, it's before cell phones. So people are like running to the pay phone, <laughs> you know, calling their friends. Oh, yeah. You gotta get down here, Billy Idol's on stage, you know? And um, so lo little by little it started filling up. And, uh, and then it, that was it. That was, we were the last thing to ever wow, play Max's. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. Yeah, but CBs I never played. Played yeah. a club that was down the street. I actually lived like right up the block from CBs. But it was kind of by the time, uh, by the time I lived by there, it kind of its, it's heyday was gone. You know, yeah. it, was, it was this. It was the the there was more bands like the kind of um, straight edge punk bands, you know, which were they were much younger than me, and right. it wasn't. I wasn't part of that scene, so. Uh, you know, it was not, not, uh, it wasn't the same CDs as late seventies, you know? Right. Did you, do you know, you're talking about making your t-shirts. Do you know George Lynch? I've met him once at my hairdressers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is he was, they were playing, um, here in Charlotte and I know a guy who helped George recover some equipment that had been stolen and he, oh, shit. this dude also collects all these George Lynch signature guitars or whatever. So right. we set up a shoot with like 35 guitars. George Lynch came in and we're shooting. And he was like, after, as soon as we finished shooting, he's like, dude, I got to run because I have to run and go buy t-shirts and like some paint pens real quick because our merch didn't show. So <laughs> our merch is someplace else. So I'm going to make, you know, Lynch mob shirts real quick or whatever, as fast as right. I can back at the hotel. So <laughs> I love that. Handmade Lynch Bob shirts, you know, and yeah. 
to me, and some guy was like, yeah, whatever. And I was like, nah, dude, he actually, you know, made the shirt. And to me, I was thinking that's probably worth way more than this. Well, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, because he actually made it. So, like, you guys, if anybody had those shirts, right. they probably worth a ton of cash at this uh, point. Absolutely, yeah. Well, did you ever have pretty... any equipment stolen? I did. One, really? one, one time out of uh, Paisley Park Studios, which was Prince's studio. Here, yeah. Um, so I had an amp. Uh, we went to rehearse there with Vince. Uh, we were getting ready for the Vince Neil tour and Paisley Park has a soundstage. So we went and rehearsed there. Um, and that complex is incredible. I've been there since, if anyone uh, has an opportunity, now it's a museum, it's a Prince Museum and uh, they give you a tour through it. It's really worthwhile. And you, um, it, it's, uh, it's an incredible facility. But we, we were rehearsing there, it would have been like 1991 or something. And uh, I had an amplifier that's now become pretty sought after by a guy named Mike Saldano. And uh, lo and behold, the amp went up, came up missing somehow. I don't know how. But uh, the, the drag about it is, you know, we, when you travel and you tour, you usually have backup amps and right. all, you, all your gear with you. So uh, sometimes you don't, it doesn't become apparent right away that something was stolen, you know. Uh, oh, shit, you know, where's that amp? I don't know. You know, oh, it was with us when, you know, da, da, da. Um, so that that's actually the only piece of gear that I've had uh, stolen. Well, damn, that's probably pretty good for as long as you've been doing it. Yeah, I'm real real careful. I take really good care of where my gear is. It's in a secure locker, and it, every everything is signed in and out for, and and stuff like that. You know, so um, I I just hate I hate to hate the idea that you know. I know so many bands have had like, you know, especially, especially on the, on the, on the kind of smaller circuit where they have the gear in the, in a truck or a trailer or something, you know, and they're staying in a hotel and it's, somebody breaks in and, you know, it's like, that's how they, you know, that's how they earn their living, man. That's their tools, you know, it's like, that's. Yeah, I think it's terrible. Yeah. And I think the worst is, I think the George Lynch thing, this guy had stolen, I want to say a couple of guitars and he yeah. went, yeah, it wasn't just like some random dude. It was some guy who actually had worked for him. And so oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. I've had, I, I know every I know the home addresses of everybody that works with that's, me. That's smart. <laughs> and when they're all good people, man. <laughs> I think they kick kick the crap out of somebody trying to steal my gear. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so you're talking about working with Vince Neil. You worked with him and Sebastian Bach, right? I did, yeah. I mean, uh, Sebastian, I just sent, uh, uh, you know, he's a, he's a buddy of mine. I know him and I've, I've uh, you know, shared the stage with him a number of times. But I, uh, uh, his, his last solo record, uh, he had uh, other writers on it and John Five oh, contributed yeah. some stuff. So I just sent over some tracks to his producer and uh, said, hey, man, man, you know, uh, he said, hey, man, if you got anything, you know, I sent over some stuff and uh, they ended up using a couple of tunes, yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But I, I you know, I, it's it's never the same as when you're in the studio and you, yeah. you know, like creating it from ground up and you're rehearsing it and it's a band. And, um, and a lot of things are done these days through file files are shared and you know, hey, I'll throw a guitar solo on it and then we're gonna send it to England and this guy's gonna do this on it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't. I, that, that doesn't work for, for Billy Idol. We just did, uh, we recorded uh, about six tracks with producer Butch Walker. Uh, and fortunately, Butch has his own studio and he's kind of, kind of his own, he, he just does everything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we, when we finished in uh, Vegas in March, we said, we'll go in the studio with Butch, but we'll both, we'll, we'll all um, social distance and quarantine make sure we're all okay. And then we went in and it was just the three of us. And, and it was, you know, I, that direct uh, collaboration. Yeah. And it just, you can't substitute it because something that that guy is going to do is going to affect the way that I'm playing this. Whereas if I get a file, uh, it's, it, it's, it's already done, you know, and it's like, I can only play on top of it. I can't play within it. 
Right. Whereas, you know, if you're in the room and you go, hey, uh, I did, hey, what did you just do? Oh, let's, oh, let's play this together. So it becomes an arrangement. You know, it's, it's like cooking. <clears throat> you know, imagine somebody's giving you something and then you just add one ingredient. It's, you know, it's not the same as being in there with your grandma and making the <laughs> sauce and, you know, grilling the thing. And, you know, it's collaboration, man. It's a big part of making music. Now, I always thought it was weird you'd hear that two people who did a song together never met each other. Yeah. Until I remember I was, there was something I was watching. It was some award show and it was a duet. And these two musicians, artists, had never met each other until they showed up on stage together to rehearse for that yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I always just thought that was strange. Yeah, I mean, if it's something that you're just guesting on, you know, like it's an existing song or something, you're going to do a duet <clears throat> for a performance, that's different. But, um, you know, writing a song and creating something that's going to be recorded, uh, I, I, I think is got to be in the room got to be in the same room yeah i would think it would make a huge difference it does yeah for yeah. sure yeah tell me about cameo man what made cameo you right yeah cameo? <laughs> well you know um what i had hoped would happen actually did happen which is um we do meet and greets with billy and and i and i think when you've had a f almost 40 year career uh a lot of the times this you know people will bring you pictures or but a lot of times the people that you meet you've meant you've meant your music has meant something to them right, yeah. and maybe they um as an example i you know they got their first billy idol record and their parent you know that kept banging on their door to shut that shit down you know yeah. hey shut it down. And now their parent's not around anymore it's passed on and and you re, and you remind them of you know these experiences or the first time a couple met they came to a or they or I or they got married to white wedding or eyes without face was their song and now their kid is with them and he's getting ready to buy his first guitar and what what do I suggest you know I mean yeah. there's a lot of amazing stories and a lot of the high school yearbooks you know they'll bring because they had hair like Billy or they wrote in it you know uh, you know it, it, you know I'm going to be Billy, Billy right. Idol or I'm going to meet Billy. It's, there's a lot of history there. Um, and the least that I could do is, is honor that. And with Cameo, the ones that I do are a little bit different because a lot of people just do greetings and stuff. And I, I made it known that I would show guitar bits, you know. It's not a guitar lesson, right. but if they have a specific thing, uh, you know, Hey, would you show me how to play the solo of so and so? Or I got a question about this or this amp thing or whatever. So, um, so it's a way to communicate. You know, yeah. it's not. You know, I of course I get a couple of the birthday greetings or whatever. But a lot of times, they want to know a story or I heard this or that. And um, so it's been. You know, look, if I was, if I could have gotten Jimmy Page to make me a video. Oh yeah. You know, hey, that second bar of, you know, Black Dog, I, you know, how, does, how do you get that rhythm together? And he would make a video showing it. I would have <laughs> yeah. signed me up, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, because I'm not a guitar teacher. Um, you know, I'm not a, you know, there are guys who are really, when people ask me that, you know, my kid is playing guitar, or I'm going to, you know, I need a teacher. There are guys that I think are fantastic about it. Uh, they do online lessons, you know, by a Skype or whatever. Right. I assume. Um, and I'll refer them because, you know, I don't know how I do what I do. <laughs> it's just, yeah, at this point, it's just like eating or whatever. But I will explain a, 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 a technical question or something. So, How long does, is there a time limit that Cameo sets or is that up to you? No, or is that... it's really up to me. Well, that's um, yeah, I mean, they, you know, usually the people, if they just want to, you know, if it's a birthday greeting or something, people are going to do 30 seconds or something like that. But I, I always go off on tangents enough, you know, hey, man, you know, if they say, oh, you know, my, uh, my wife is celebrating or this or, you know, I mean, sometimes people, I've gotten a number of them, people have beat cancer or they're going wow. through it or something. And, yeah. um, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I've had family members who've dealt with that and I know how hard that is on the family and um and um you know they'll ask me to 
play something or just, you know, or give some encouragement or whatever, you know, and, um, you know, wh what little I can do, I'll do, you know. I think that's great. Yeah. I think it's good that you're on there. They People have that opportunity to meet, you know, to meet you, you know, and, or at least have you do some kind of thing like that. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's really there is, cool. And there is, there's another, like, a, I don't know what they call it, a cameo exclusive where we do a live uh, Zoom chat. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, I did one with a couple last week who, uh, who I remember they, they've been dating and, uh, and they came to one of our meet and greets and, um, and uh, they really, they're super Billy Idol fans and uh, they just wanted to hang out and chat because of COVID, you know, people can't oh, get yeah. out, they can't hang. And sometimes they'll put a request in to have my wife pop on and say hello. And, you know, um, so it's a way to communicate and kind of like, you know, we were on for, I don't know, it must have been 45 minutes just shooting the shit, just like, you know, hey, remember when restaurants were open? <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> so. Yeah, it's cool. It's, you know, I didn't know at first, but now I'm, uh, 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 I enjoy doing it. Yeah, I think it's very yeah. cool. There are a lot of cool people on there. So I think it's, it's a good thing for you to be on there and do it. Do you, your, um, your manager said you were also doing a kind of master class guitar thing? Yeah, that's, a, that's from Rock and Roll High. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's a, uh, what is it called? The Rock and Roll... Uh, uh, Trying to blank on. Oh God, they're gonna kill me. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Maybe um, I got it on my phone. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, so you got a new website, right? com. I do. Yeah. Thank uh, you for reminding me. <laughs> yep. Hell froze over, and you recently joined Twitter. I did. I did. Yeah. How's that going? It's all right. I don't have that many people on. My wife is really active on Twitter. I I I, I hadn't joined it because if people want to know when I'm doing something, it's chances are. Uh, she has like over a million followers online, oh, you know, with, with her social, she's, you know, she's a bit younger than me. So she, she grew up with this stuff. Right. Uh, and so she knows how to work it and know how to, you know, so anything we do, we're, we're always together. So they're going to know about it through her. But eventually my manager said, you know, you should have Twitter, you know, Twitter on there just so yeah. you can kind of, and I'm, I'm more, I just look at people doing goofy Right. <laughs> hey, did you see that dog you know <laughs> i don't really pay much attention to twitter anymore i have an instagram and i basically yeah. just have everything from instagram go immediately to twitter yeah uh, oh, same right. here i mean i yeah i mean there's certain people i'll pop on to just see because you know they just they do ridiculous stuff and, yeah. you know, oh okay okay but, i found uh, it it's the rock and roll fantasy camp yeah there we go, there we go. Class. right yeah so what they do is and there's tons of people that do this. So even if you're not, uh, you know, uh, people should go to the website and look. Um, I've done two so far. And what it is, is it's usually about 25 people that are on. And I will do, um, uh, w the way mine works is I'll do performance of like three different improvisational things. Um, <clears throat> then I'll talk a bit about, you know, how I approach music, how I approach guitar. Uh, and then they can all ask questions and then there's a back and forth dialogue. Uh, it's really well done. Um, and there's a moderator and uh, it oh, runs really cool. smoothly. And it's, it's, um, I will say that, um, you know, out of curiosity, um, I, uh, you know, uh, Steve Howe from Yes was a big yeah. influence on me. And he's not known to be, he's a bit more reserved, English gentleman. Yeah. Um, and he signed up, you know, they signed him to, I said, you got to send me Steve's uh, class because I'm, I'm such a fan and I know virtually everything about what he's done. And uh, I'd like to see how he, how he handled this. And I will tell you that, that he was in that setting, he was really affable and played and explained things and influences that now I've followed his music for 50 years that I'd never knew. Really? He's, he's reeling off all these uh, um, Chet Atkins things and blues guitar things and, and ragtime guitar. Things. That's his wheelhouse. That's that you wouldn't, you know, he's known as this prog guitar player, but, right. but really he started as a, as a country and a jazz guy and he's showing how he applied it to all of the yes stuff and, it gave me a whole different insight 
And I would imagine it's that way for all of the artists that get to do it. And they don't just have guitar players, they have producers and managers. And, oh, wow. um, <clears throat> so um, it's, it's really a good forum and you get a lot of information from it, you know? So uh, yeah, it sounds yeah. really cool. It is great. It is great. And I've done them in person uh, as well. You know, uh, I've done one here. They have a facility in Vegas. I've done, I actually think the online one, because I think people sometimes in person, they don't want to be, sing, you know, singled out, oh, yeah. you know, or something. And there's a little bit of, uh, you know, nobody's afraid to ask any questions or, you know, as simple or, you know, if it's guitar related or just whatever travel related. So it's, it's worked out really well. Yeah. Damn. That sounds very cool. All right, yeah. Check that out for sure. So when did you get your lip pierced? I got it in Japan. I was in, uh, so it was, um, I had, uh, I, I, I had spent, I worked with a Japanese artist named Himuro, who was like the, the, I guess the John Bon Jovi of Japan. He's a huge wow. star was, was in a big band, uh, kind of like the Billy Idol, uh, big band in the eighties and then went out in solo and he's, he's retired now. But when I worked with him in the nineties, I was in for two years in a row, I was in Japan for three months out of the year. And um, if you have ever seen that film lost in translation, that was, my, <laughs> that was my life. It's crazy. Cause I was the only Western artist in the band uh, for one tour. There was no English. I had a translator with me 24 seven, but there was uh I was the only English speaking. You ever asked a translator here too? Like I had an assistant who's Mexican. Mm -hmm. Love this dude. And I was on a set and we were shooting for a Hispanic magazine. Everybody's speaking Spanish and I don't speak mm -hmm. Spanish. I was looking mm -hmm. at my sister. I was like, what the hell are they saying? He's like, don't worry, man. Unless you hear the word gringo, <laughs> hey, don't worry yeah, about it. Yeah. <laughs> All well, right. the, well, these, um, so, I, so I'm in Japan for three months and, and when you tour, I had also recorded records with him. He lives in Los Angeles. Um, and um, when you tour with a Japanese artist, it's not like touring with a Western artist because you go to the cities uh, like Guma. There's like, I mean, you're out there in the sticks. You're really, oh, wow. I mean, some of these cities, there's not an English site or English speaking person anywhere and there's no pictures like in tokyo you could look at the, the menu and go oh i want that you know fish fish you know <laughs> uh, you know uh deer or whatever you know <laughs> so you know you tokyo is is very cosmopolitan um but it was an absolutely incredible experience for me uh i loved every minute of it every every damn minute of being there and touring. And, um, and I had been so, it was very soon after I got sober and I thought it was a, a number one, it was a challenge for me to stay sober alone yeah. for three months. I mean, I could have really done a lot of damage. Oh, um, sure, yeah. But I even like sought out, I would go to AA meetings for like American servicemen and stuff oh, wow. like that in, in, in the cities that I could. Um, and I, and to celebrate my sobriety after being there for three months, I said, I got to do something, you know, we're, uh, you know, and I wasn't going to get a tattoo. I didn't want, I have a tattoo now of my wife, but then I was, I didn't want a tattoo. Um, and I said, Oh, okay. I'll, I'll remember it. I'll get my lip pierced. I'll go. Okay. I had seen, you know, in this one area, uh, there was like a lip piercing place. And I said, the day before I leave, I'm going to go up there. And that's what I did. You know, I went up there and I went, well, yeah. How long did that hurt for? It it, it didn't hurt. Really? Oh, yeah, it cool. really does. All it's right. an air. I guess it's a part of your body that you do. And really, it's the 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 instrument is so sharp and. It's the total opposite of having your tongue pierced. Oh my god! I wouldn't do that. What I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Right. Do Everybody that. knows how to do it. That and their nipples. They're like, no, don't do it. They no, both are painful. No, no. no it's, yeah. <laughs> how long have you been sober? Um. I've got, a, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't drank or, or, you know, been in the 80s of cocaine. Everybody did that since right, back yeah. then. I had a situation where I slipped on uh, pain medication. Yeah. And what, what happened was, and this was all new to me, and I tell people now because uh, we were on tour and I, I, I was pretty uh, 
it, you know, it was just like one of these, it was almost like a freak thing. Uh, I got off the bus and it w had been raining and, um, and we were in New Orleans and, I, and uh, you know, it's a lot of rainfall in New Orleans and the, the sidewalks have this kind of slope thing. So the water, yeah. the, and I was getting I had a guitar in one hand and backpack or whatever. And I slipped and I put my hand down and I fractured my wrist. Mm. And we were, we were only about a month into a three month tour. And, um, and I was with our uh, security guy and I went up to the, it, it actually, I knew something bad happened, but it wasn't like excruciating pain. But then when I got up to my room, my wrist blew up. And so I called our security guy, I go, I think I did something really bad. We went over to the hospital, they took the x-rays and they, I had fractured my ulna right straight through. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh man, you know, this is, this is bad. I got two more months on the road. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and I found the doctor uh, and she said, well, there's really, there's not much that we can do for it. We can put a class, you know, a cast on you. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I said, I'm, I'm you know, the, it's painful, but I'm not in excruciating pain. Um, I said, I wonder if you could do the cast where it's, because fortunately it was my right hand. So right. my picking hand, if it was this hand, I would have been done for. Yeah. But this hand, I just basically got to stick a pick in it and keep it in one position. I said, so I had a guitar pick. I put the pick in my hand. They did the cast like this. Da, da, da. And I said, the one thing I don't want to do is do irreparable damage, yeah. um, long-term damage, because... I'd rather have somebody come out and fill in for me. So the doctor said, well, here's what we'll do. I'll come to the show. We had a show the next day. I'll come to the show. We'll, we'll, we'll x-ray you right after the show and see if it shifts at all. And, uh, and do, uh, you know, check, do another x-ray. Right. So she's on the tour bus. We bring the tour bus after the show. And obviously they gave me pain, pain medication. Go, play the show. We look at the x-rays, hadn't shifted. And she goes, well, if that's what you're going to do every night and you can make your way through it, then, you know, you won't damage, you know, you won't do any permanent damage. So, so I was in this cast. Eventually they gave me a, a different cast that was kind of semi removable, but I got off the road and I was addicted to pain medication yeah. uh, because it, it's, it creeps up on you and you're not even getting high. You're just trying to not get sick. And that's the thing about opiates that so it's very different than I, I would imagine if people are al alcoholic, it's probably you go through DTs or whatever they call it. Right. But, um, so I actually had to go through detox and, and, uh, and do that whole thing. So uh, wow. that was like an eye opener and that, <clears throat> And uh, I tell people that, you know, that's, that's the real dangerous one because uh, then the, the, the DEA and the government steps in at some point and says, well, we're not going to allow people more than a certain amount and you're not going to be able to refill it. And, this, and what happens is people end up getting it off the street and it, and it has fentanyl in it. Yeah. And that's what Prince died from. And a lot of people, that's, that stuff is bad news yeah. and uh it's uh i just tell people you know even when they have some procedure i say be real you know put put somebody else in charge of the pain medication to give it to you and and be real careful only take it if you absolutely have to because it'll creep up on you and you won't even realize it yeah well, that's smart my wife's a coo of an outpatient rehab so they're seeing a okay. lot of that and yeah the the ceo is recovering addict and he was addicted to i think he did heroin he did oxy he did yep. you know coke all that he was i remember they somebody died from doing heroin with fentanyl yeah that's and i was like why would you want to do that and she asked him and he said well as soon as an addict severe addict hears that somebody just od they're like oh that must be some good shit let me go try that crazy yeah it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy and everything is you know it's it's uh it's not regulated. You don't know what you're getting. And, um, and uh, it takes a lot of people out because that stuff is, is so potent and it's, you know, it comes from China and, uh, and it's, it's bad news, man. It's, I, I, there's, and this, and this, I think there's no, there's no stigma about, about getting help now. You know, it's not like it was, you know, uh, 
back in the 80s, you know, rehab, we didn't know what rehab was, right. you know. Um, but now, uh, you know, it's different and there is help and, and uh, there's a lot of good programs and, and even you can do meetings online and, and you know, uh, most of the musicians that I work with are sober. You know, we, we, we filled our, car, our, our quota <laughs> right. back in the day. We, you know. <laughs> well, it's amazing to me. It seems like even some of the younger bands are not as psychotic about it as they used to be. You know, yeah. you just hear some of these younger bands just talk in interviews or whatever. And I was listening to some guys from Bad Wolves talking back and forth the other day. It was a drummer and a guitar player, and they're both talking about how they can't really drink much anymore because it takes a day or two to recover. So they just don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're like 30 years old. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, that part I definitely understand. All right, man, I'm going to let you go. I got one last question for you. Sure. What's the strangest or most interesting, unusual thing that's happened to you since you have been in this whole business? Um, strangest well hmm. I mean I've seen some strange <laughs> stuff um, there there are a number of things that are that are coincidences but you say well how how could they possibly have occurred you know just by chance or something um, that uh, I'll give you an example. There was a, uh, there, there was a, uh, a girl. When I was in a cover band, there was a, a girl who followed the band. Who, she was a friend of the singer, and this is kind of a long story, but I'll try. Right. No problem. Take your time. I'm, and she got cancer. I don't have any kind of time living on this, so we can take it. Okay. As far as you want. Well, she she got cancer. Uh, not I remember it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and and. She was a real fan of the band, but she was also a fan of another guitar player guy that was like a local uh, black guitar player. He was like phenomenal. And she gave each of us, she was, she just loved the way that we, we used to jam a lot. And she gave each of us uh, a silver bracelet. And um, she said, I want you guys to have this bracelet because knowing that you guys are, that we're all connected is going to help me through my, my cancer treatment. Um, and, uh, and I lost, you know, I, she made it through, she survived. And then I went on to different bands and traveled around, blah, 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 blah. but I, I always had that bracelet on, I never took it off. I always took it as a really good sign. She made it, oh, yeah. you know, years later, <clears throat> um, I never kept up with the other guitar player. I didn't really know what he was doing. Uh, and then Many years later, I'm at the First Avenue Club in Minneapolis, which is where Purple Rain was filmed. That was the oh, yeah. Prince's yeah. place. And we were already successful. We, this was on the whip. I went there after, after one of our shows. It's like an after party just to hang out. It, was, uh, it must have been like 88 by then. And I go to pass the, the uh, I'm on the stairwell and I go to pass and this guy comes towards me. He goes, hey, Steve Stevens. And I go, yeah, he goes, man, great guitar player. I love you, the way you play. And um, I said, oh, thank you very much. He goes, yeah, my name's Daryl Thompson. And I go, you know me. He goes, yeah, you're Steve Stevens, Billy Idol, you know. I go, no. I go, we know each other. I go, my family name back then was Schneider. That was the given family name. I changed it to Stevens. I go, Steve Schneider. And he goes, that's you. And he was the other guitar player and I held up my hand and we both had the silver bracelet wow. still on. And he was now at that point, he was the guitar player for Peter Tosh. He had gone on to work with Peter, Peter Tosh. And it was just an, un to reconnect that way. And wow. we still had the bracelet and, um, and then, uh, you know, um, it was just a very, 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 you know, things like that. You go, what's the chances of those kind of little things kind of, you know, they've happened a number of times where I've connected with people that are out of, out of the, the blue or something. And it's just like, you get, you know, this, there's some mumbo jumbo going on. That's way beyond what I understand. Yeah, that's so, a trip, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. 
So how'd you come, how'd you come up with, I know I, I was going to let you go, but how'd you come up with Stevens as your last name? Well, my, my, when, um, <laughs> or is it just easy? Just put it in ass and be no, done. It's a, it's, no, it's a good story. The, um, so when, when my grandparents landed at Ellis Island, Schneider is a German name. It means tailor. If you go to get your, um, clothes hemmed or whatever, it's, you go to a Schneider. Okay. Uh, it was never, my family's not German. They're Russian and Polish. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was just, they were just so happy to be in a new country. They, they blurted out some name and they wrote it down. They said Schneider. So <clears throat> I'm like thinking, you know, uh, you know, by the time I was in the band before uh, Billy Idol, I'm like, Schneider doesn't, just doesn't sound like a, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, 20,000 people in, in Madison Square Garden, Schneider, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, I don't know, it doesn't sound good. So yeah. I'm trying to come, I, so I can't use Taylor because it sounds like Stephen Tyler. Right, yeah. Like so I'm like, I don't know what to do. So one day we're like deciding this and the the second guitar player from New York Dolls was over at our loft that we lived in, and his name's Sylvain Sylvain. And we're going, oh, what are we going to call this motherfucker? <laughs> what are we going to call him? And Sylvain says, do what I do. Just use your first name twice. I said, well, if a New York Doll tells me to oh, use yeah. it. And that's how I got my name. And I've since seen him. We did a show together. Uh, about 10 years ago. And I said, do you remember? And he said, I gave you your, your name. He goes, I, I want some money. <laughs> he goes, it worked, right? <laughs> I go, yeah. So that's how I got my name. Oh, that's a killer story, man. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that was great. Well, man, thank you so much. My pleasure. I really yeah. appreciate it. This was fun. I really enjoyed it. I feel like I could keep talking to you, but I'm going to let you go. Yeah, well, let, let's stay in touch yeah, on, online and and um and uh i, I really liked your work when i looked when oh I thank you yeah at, maybe yeah. someday when um we're allowed to travel and whatever maybe we could get the guy to grab lunch or something and do or some hell, i'll even come in and yeah yeah that's yeah. what i ask you yeah i would love to shoot you yeah yeah do absolutely stuff you do some studio stuff if you guys are shooting i can do behind the scenes you know, yeah. just whatever just to have it you guys can have it be that'd my be pleasure cool. absolutely yeah that'd yeah. be killer man who shot the stuff yeah. um Kent sent me two shots of you. That, right. Who shot that, especially that tight shot, but both of them were killer shots. Um, not, not sure. You remember? I'm not sure which shots they are. Uh, Let me see if I can pull one up. Maybe I can pull it up. I don't know. One's a, it's a shot of you with just your guitar, real tight. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see if it'll pull up. Maybe. Seriously. Oh, this one. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, oh, my God, I forgot his name. The, a friend of mine who is a publicist, it was her. She was dating him at the time. But he's like the official. Oh, it's terrible. I should remember his name. He's the official photographer for Def Leppard. Oh, okay. uh, he, oh man, he's going to kill me. <laughs> but uh, we actually, that's on my terrace just here in my, in my apartment here. Uh, but, we, yeah, he's very good. Uh, and then the other shots, I think, uh, are my, one of you like in a desert. Okay. That's my friend. That was Haristo and he is Bulgarian. Yeah, that one. Right. He yeah. did those. Um, a lot of the photographers that I, I would say all of the photographers I know are through my wife because she was a model and she okay. did a lot of sessions for these people. Uh, and she knew Haristo cause he was going to, school here the la photography school and that was done as a project for his school i didn't even know who that dude was till literally about a month or two ago yeah yeah and i discovered him was, yeah. yeah and um and uh and he was a friend of my my wife's oh wow uh, he was just a student there and she said you know you should shoot with Haristo because um you know he's uh he's really she had done some photos with him actually she did make up for a band called in this moment that's how she met him yeah i've heard of this she, guy right and uh, my wife used to work as a makeup artist and she met him he did all of the bands for uh for uh the the record company that they were on and and she okay. recognized right away he was really good she knows uh, the good ones. Yeah. So uh, she said, Oh, you should work with him. And it was great. Was, she keeps you yeah. from shooting with the bad ones. 
Yeah, I don't, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, everybody has, you know, unless they're, I mean, now everything can be fixed, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, yeah. And you're a good dude. I got to say, right. you're, you're, Thanks, a, you're a good guy because you could have slammed all kinds of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, glad why, you didn't because I'm, that's, I'm, in no way I'm trying to get that out of anybody. Why and waste our time? It's impressive and I, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, there's yeah. no reason to, to do that. I mean, you know, it's that thing, of, you know, if you, if you ain't got nothing good to say about somebody, don't, don't waste yeah. your time on it. Yeah, that's the way my daughter, my youngest daughter is like that. You'll say something, like my wife will say something. She plays volleyball. And okay. She's one of the starters. She's been on these teams and she'll say something about some girls like, so what do you think about so-and-so there who was shooting and if she, or playing? And if my daughter doesn't think she's any good, she goes, mm. yeah, that's all she does. <laughs> right. She doesn't, yeah. she doesn't go, Oh my God, I can't believe yeah. she, she just shows. Mm. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, it's, in, it's enjoyable and it's nice and refreshing. Yeah. Why waste right. the energy? Because that energy comes back to you. Exactly. You know, I, I um, the, one of the greatest expressions I ever learned, I was at a, Early in my sobriety, I was at a church in an AA meeting, and there was a homeless guy came in. But he was sober. And he said, uh, he shared, he said, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get some money together so I can get a hotel room or whatever. Was, didn't want money from us. This is right. like, you know, this is real deal survival. And he said, uh, and he said, you know, man, he was talking about resentments. And he said, resentments are like me drinking the poison and expecting the other person to die from it. Yeah, I've heard that. And, yeah, I and, love that. And it's just, you know, that energy for me to say, and I know musicians that are still bitter about situations or this manager ripped me off and, and they're still, and it's, stop, it's like they, they're stopped in their tracks. They haven't moved on yeah. from it because it's still it's only hurting themselves it's only stopping them and whoever did them wrong is long oh yeah uh, they might not even be alive anymore <laughs> and they're still holding this shit and it's like man i got no time for that you know um, you know it's just bad energy uh, like yeah, to keep things... I tell my daughters when they were younger i was like if they have something with some girl or they're upset or something I was like do you think she doesn't even know you're upset with her right. you're over here freaking out about it and she's right. all with her life and doesn't care because she has no clue that's exactly so, it. It's not on. worth it, man. It's, yeah. it's just not, you know, so. <laughs> Thank right. you, man. I really Wise words. <laughs> All right. oh, everybody, everybody watching, listening, be sure and thumbs up, subscribe, like it, comment, all that stuff. We'll keep doing it.